before we talk about the topic and uh, our speaker, uh, let's take care of few lo logistics that make sure that you know uh, how we are going to uh, uh, handle this uh, presentation in terms of grades and uh, other uh, relevant things. Um, go right in the back and uh, register, please. In the future, please come on time. Uh, to avoid wasting time, please. Don't wait to the last minute. Um, majority of the people here are students. There are a few others from the community that uh, here they are not a captive audience. They are here because they want to, but the rest of you, perhaps some of you, not all of you, I won't generalize, that uh, here um, you want to get some kind of a credit for it, which is OK. Uh, everybody who is for the credit here must uh, register. Without the paperwork, uh, you will not get a credit. Uh, you keep the forms, and you return back at the end when you check out. So if you leave before we adjourn, there'll be points deducted. And um, uh, make sure that you stay uh, for the whole duration of the presentation. If you are my student, for just being here, you will get 50 points on my grading scale. Paper is optional. If, uh, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Uh, Register in the back before you come and sit down. You have already registered. And don't walk in front of the camera if you are late, please, uh, because we are recording, so we don't want to mess up uh, the recording. Um, paper is optional. If you do, you get 25 points. If you don't, that's OK. For our Wednesday meeting, also the same way. For your presence, you get 50 points. And if you do the paper, uh, you get 25 additional points. If you are happy with your 100 points to replace your research essay, you are good to go. So you don't have to do anything else. But I encourage you, don't be satisfied with just 100 points. Because remember, there is an essay, final is coming, fast, soon. Many students do very poorly on the essay. This is my experience from the past uh, students. They do well in the four uh, multiple choice questions, memorization, all those. And then when it comes to final, a, an A drops to a C or D. Dr. K, I had an A. Why did I get a C or D in my course grade? Because you didn't do well. You didn't take the final series. So what I will suggest to all of you, if you can, take advantage of uh, all the extracurricular activities. Build up 200 points. Max out. That way. You don't have to worry about it. That will be final, will be easy for you. If you want to. International Day on April 19th is a good grade making uh, opportunity for you. So uh, go ahead and read the information. There are all sorts of uh, activities available. You can be volunteer, you can be exhibitor, and uh, all sorts of other activities are available. For example, uh, if you even sing a national anthem, you get points for it. So read those information carefully. In the left-hand side, the bar of the web page, you will see uh, the information. Many students don't read it. They email me, ask the questions. I say, all your questions answered is on the website. So make sure you read those. And uh, avoid the uh, waste of your time and my time. Uh, I don't want to take much time. I think I covered the basic uh, information about uh, today. Do you have any questions about the logistics? Grades before I introduce our uh, speaker and talk about the topic. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if you do the optional parts and maybe you don't get a hundred, uh -huh. um, do you still go ahead and write if you want? The, I'm not sure what you the uh, critical thinking essay. One more time. Okay, if. I come for this, uh -huh. and I don't get a hundred. Correct. Right? Can I still go ahead and write the critical, the critical thinking ex um, essays, the compulsory one? Yeah, you can write the research paper. Um, then you can use your allowed to do hundred point extra credit. Yes, you can do that. Okay. 
But remember, research paper, there are strict guidelines, stuff, follow them. It's just turning in doesn't necessarily guarantee you the points. So you have to exactly follow the guidelines and uh, write accordingly. Mm -hmm. Good question. Any other questions? No? Yes? Um, will you explain the essay for this event? Yeah, the essay, the guidelines is on the website. Make sure that you read it, that um, uh, go to the, again, left uh, hand side bar. There's a menu. Just go read it and stay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, uh, very good. Thank you very much for coming to this um, uh, lecture. And uh, you may wonder that why Dr. K, political scientist, is talking about food. Have you wondered that, about that question? Uh, what he has to do with the food? Is food relevant to the politics? <laughs> yes or no? Yeah. Folks, Every day, three times a day, if you eat three times, you vote. <laughs> Your, what you eat is political statement, believe it or not. Why? Your health affects your health, doesn't it? Is health care political subject? What you eat, does it impact environment? Is environment political subject? What you do, what you eat, does it affect animals? Billions of animals every year are killed because what we eat. If you are animal right, yes. What you eat, does it affect the economy? So am I convinced you that eating food is a political subject? You're wrong with it. I mean, you can teach courses on this topic about your health. We can look at from the health angle. We can look at from the environmental aspect. We can talk about the economy and animal rights. You name it. Each one, or you open a can of worms, just you can talk uh, forever. And why I am a vegan? I'm a vegan. You say, Dr. K, why are you vegan? Well, I became a vegan about 10 years ago. And the only re uh, thing I regret is that I wish I would have become vegan 40 years ago, 50 years ago. That's the only regret I have. When I became a vegan, I saw the health benefits for myself. I was so excited that I said, I need to share this with my students. That really is life-changing experience. Folks, we are not here, me and our speaker is not here. We are not selling a diet. You know, uh, take the pills or powder, lose before, after, good magazine, bad magazines, covers, nothing like that. We are here to approach from scientific point of view. So uh, before further ado, I, I just don't want to take much time because our time is valuable with our speaker. And uh, the most dangerous weapon in the world is what? Do you know? Information. Ignorance. Yeah, misinformation. What is the most dangerous weapon? The mass destruction. Anyone? Facebook? <laughs> yes, it can be, yes. This is the most dangerous mass destruction weapon. Because of this, millions of animals are killed. It affects your health and you name it. So this is, remember, the fork is the most dangerous uh, weapon, mass destruction. Now let's talk about our speaker. I'm not going to take much time on the introduction of our speaker. Our speaker is a very Googleable person. Just Google him, and you will see a, a very impressive uh, record of teaching and practicing. And uh, Dr. Blake uh, is coming from Hawaii all the way, see, from another country. When he told me that he uh, passed the custom, you know, and immigration, I said, why? Hawaii is part of the US, but it's considered another country, huh? No, it's really in the US, but we came from a different country. Oh, you came from Mexico, right? Yeah, yeah that, okay, I, I, I wasn't sure that why that happened, yeah. Okay, sorry, that clarifications, <laughs> because he didn't tell me that he was in Mexico, yeah. So anyhow, uh, uh, he's, uh, I have already put his bio in the website. 
So let's give him a text size uh, welcome and give the floor to him so he can uh, tell us what he knows and we can learn from him. So, thank you, Dr. Rashid. Uh, that's a tough one to say, isn't it? <laughs> Khosro Shahi. Khosro Shahi. Yeah. Almost what I said. Yeah, you're a closer. If I, you see me walking around taking pictures, please don't pay attention to me because I just have to have some record and stuff for funding purpose. So uh, pay just attention to our speech. Is my microphone on? No. 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 How about now? No. How about now? No. How about now? no. Looks like something fell out. Hello? 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 Steve, okay. Hello. You have to turn on. You had to It'll be just by voice today. Any AV experts here? No, yeah, he left. Yeah, he was here for a few minutes. Can you get him to fix that? Yeah. This person. This is Walker. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming here today. And luckily, uh, I have a loud voice, so it's a small enough room. I think we can get by until the AV guy comes and re supercharges the microphone. Here he comes. He's there here. Oh, he's here now. Good. We're going to talk about food, and it's a subject that is uh, much loved. Can you talk like about yourself mind. for a moment? Yeah. Can you tell us a little about yourself, please? I will. It's, I've got a slide coming. Okay. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here in Rosie Tyler. <laughs> How's that? Um, how about now? No. Okay, let's try now. Okay. Yes. That's better. Yeah. Go ahead and talk so they can adjust it. Okay. Uh, I'm talking so they can adjust it now. And it, it seems very good in the back. You hear me? Okay, great. This is a lot easier for me, too. How do you make your food choices? How, how do you know what to choose? What's the first way you choose a food? How do you choose a restaurant? Local, convenient, cheap. What about habit? Doesn't habit play a big part in, in what we eat? People are very habitual. I analyze diets. I even have a dietary analysis software that I developed to analyze diets. People say, well, do you need a week, two weeks of my diet? No, just one day will do it. Because we eat very similarly each day. It's, it's true. Uh, how do you make your choices? Does anyone make their choice of what's to eat by what's convenient and quick? Who, who does that? I do it. A lot of people do that. What about cheap? Does that affect your choice? If it's cheap, that makes a difference. What about if it's food that you're familiar with, that your family ate? A lot of people do that. Well, I'm going to present some information to you today about food and humans. I want to ask you a question. There are carnivorous animals like cats. There are omnivorous animals like bears and dogs. And then there are vegetarian animals like zebras and cows and bunny rabbits. Which one are humans? Is anyone here think that they're a carnivorous animal? Please raise their hand. Nobody here is a carnivore? OK, we got a nod and a raise hand. OK, how about omnivores? Any omnivores in the room? Omnivore means pretty much eat anything, right? OK, well, 
you have a good point because Encyclopedia Britannica defines humans as omnivores. I think they're wrong. <laughs> so the first part of this talk today is going to be looking at some beautiful animals and seeing where we fit in with those animals. Are we more like cats? Are we more like bears? Are we more like bunny rabbits? What should we be eating? If we can pick the perfect food, we can get perfect health. Perfect health is pretty nice. Perfect weight. Perfect weight's pretty nice. Disease resistance is really important in this age of COVID. And better food helps too. There, if the food matches us. If we're eating food that accelerates inflammation in our body, then the COVID cytokine storm is likely to create more damage in our bodies. So it's better to eat less of these chronic inflammatory foods. And what about protein? Haven't we heard about that all our lives? Where do you get your protein? I uh, actually started eating plant-based 51 years ago. And uh, so that's been a long time I've been eating plants. And guess what everybody has asked me for 51 years? Where do I get my protein? These are some of my works. I didn't put in the scholarly papers, they're hard to read. Um, but I have so many that I won't tell you about all of them. Uh, let's see, on the top left is diabetes breakthrough, the key to insulin resistance. Doctors and dietitians are not getting it quite right about what creates diabetes. And uh, in one of my slideshows, they took 100 students and they've had half of them a high fat breakfast, high, high in saturated fat. And the others had a normal, normally low saturated fat breakfast. Was interesting because their list memory went down 16%. Now, how long did that take? Was it months, years? Four days. Four days for the list memory to plummet. Interesting though, because of this high saturated fat breakfast for four days, their insulin, their blood sugar, went from 77 up to 1. 118. 77 is perfect. 118 is pre-diabetic. Yeah. In four days, with just a saturated fat breakfast, and not even lunch or dinner, they induce diabetes in these healthy students. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. Food's really important. Uh, so my other books, this in the middle bottom is Vitamins and Minerals Demystified in McGraw-Hill College textbook that I wrote and got more familiar with vitamins and minerals. They're in some foods, some vitamins and other foods. It's good to know some more about this. I've been trying to get this into nursing schools and doctor training schools, and I get a big no from them. But they get a big yes from the pharmaceutical books. Also, one of these books is the Mosby's Drug Guide for Nurses. Well, that's very popular in nursing schools and medical schools. Uh, I guess I won't introduce all of these, uh, there's just too many. You can go on my website, drsteveblake.com, and browse through. I try to make my books under $10 in ebook format so that you can afford them if you want to read one. I work now at the Maui Memory Clinic helping older folks with their memory through nutrition. And we've had really nice results. One of the books here is Nutrients for Memory. And that's based on the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, which I designed and ran with a huge team. And we showed that in a randomized clinical trial, real science, that you could actually reverse beginning dementia and the people came out normal. Isn't that nice? But the time to start working on dementia is when you're young. It's better not to wait until you're old because it's harder to combat it then. <laughs> This is the food advertising pyramid. You've heard about the food pyramid, right? The USDA puts one out. So this is the food advertising pyramid. Fast foods, 20% of the, the dollars spent on advertising advertise fast foods. This is not so healthy. Candy and gum get another almost 20%. Alcoholic beverages and soft drinks, those four categories comprise over 70% of the food do of the dollar spent for advertising these not very nutritious foods. On the contrary, do you see the black line on the bottom? Can you even focus that carefully? It's this big. That's all the good stuff. 
fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans, 2% of the advertising dollars. And of course, they only really advertise the more processed of those, too. So this helps shape how we eat. Constantly seeing it on television, McDonald's advertisements and all that. We're getting bombarded by these advertisements. There is actually only one sector of the economy that spends more on advertising than food. You know what that is? Drugs. Automobiles. <laughs> so what are the natural foods for man? Do you think that it's natural for human beings to push this calf aside, crawl under the cow, and start sucking on milk? Anyone think that's natural? Would anyone here like to volunteer to do it? Because I think both the calf and the mother would be very upset with this. Of course, if you look at modern conditions of milk production, it's nothing like this, that the cows are jammed in the little tiny cages their whole lives and kept pregnant and all that stuff. Now this fruit net is actually, we got this fruit in Mexico, cost about $5, and uh, vegetables. And that I think is more natural food for man. And what I'm gonna do is present information to you and let you make up your minds, and let you make up your minds if you wanna choose to change anything about the way you eat. And then I'll tell you, it might be a little difficult to do that. You might get pushback from your family, from your friends. It might be a little difficult, but luckily you have an excellent cafeteria here to choose from. <laughs> There's a story. Some students found an animal, they didn't recognize what it was, and they, they got the animal and, and they liked it and they were gonna feed it, but they didn't know what to feed it. So they drove their van over to the zoologist, professor of zoology, and said, Professor, what can we feed this animal? Can we bring it in and show you? He wisely said, no, just tell me about it. What kind of teeth does it have? Do those teeth hint to you what this animal should be eating? <laughs> Maybe not avocados and apples? Mm, what do you think, vegetables? Actually, these guys can run down a deer and eat it. Uh, what about climbing trees and getting fruit? Do you think those little stubby legs would be very good at that? Not really. Looking at the morphology, the shape of an animal can give you lots of clues to that. And by the way, there are openings for tongue cleaners for this critter here, if anyone would like to do that. <laughs> What's a natural food for a bunny? Just looking at a bunny and watching it move around, oh, they eat green leafy vegetables, don't they? Yes. They can just barely get away from prey, and you can kind of tell what a bunny eats. What about this guy? He broke one of his canines. I know a lot of people tell me, no, I'm a carnivore. Look, I have canines. And they, they point to their teeth. These are canines. And they're designed so that this bear can run up and actually puncture the hide of an animal and catch it and then tear it apart. But we can't do that. We're not capable of that. Also, uh, they're pretty fast. Look at this brown bear or black bear loping along. He's so fast he's off the ground. And how about this guy? He's a friendly little fella. The thing about these animals is that they can climb trees and get fruit. And that's their main diet. These are fruitarian animals. They also eat greens. And if they're totally starving, they'll eat some grubs or pretty much anything they can eat. But their principal food is fruit and tender vegetables. Interesting, because that's what Darwin said that humans were designed to eat, fruit and tender vegetables. Look at his teeth. They look familiar? They're a lot like human teeth. In fact, you know, gorillas are probably the closest to humans, and we all know what gorillas eat. Plants. So here we have a carnivore, this beautiful tiger. We got an omnivore, this wolfy looking dog. We have a vegan zebra. And then we have humans. We have to fit that in. Where do we fit in? The first part of the talk is going to be all these colorful pictures. And then I'm going to give you some science on the health effects of these foods, too. The dagger canines really long in the tiger, really perfectly suited 
he doesn't need a gun to go out and shoot the deer. Not at all. He can run faster than the deer. He can catch it. He can tear it apart. He can eat it. He can digest it. And he isn't bothered at all if it, it has uh, botulism toxins or something in it because he's not susceptible to getting food poisoning from meat like humans are. We all know we can't eat raw meat, right? You have to cook it to a certain temperature for so long before it's edible for humans. This guy, no problem. And the bear, same thing. He can catch, he can eat. But with humans, it's hard to see the diagram clearly, maybe the picture above, but next to the two front teeth are our canines, and they're flat. They're not capable. Uh, imagine if you could catch a cow, which I can tell you you can't, not, not outside of a fence, but if you did catch a cow, and then you bit into it, what would happen? Nothing. The cow would look around, laugh a little bit, and then walk away. We are not capable. What about a pig? Don't they make footballs out of pig skin? No, we're not gonna bite through a pig. Okay, how about a nice rooster or a chicken? Can we bite through those feathers? No. But what about the tiger or the bear? Yes, they can. More differences in teeth. Humans have thick tooth enamel because we chew a lot. These animals really don't chew too much, the omnivores and the carnivores, so they have thin tooth enamel. And I think the most significant thing is that the molars, the back teeth here, you have uppers and lowers, right? On the carnivores and the omnivores, the teeth come together like this, and they slice, the molars slice, so they can slice the meat from the animals. Now, try and slice your molars past each other. Go ahead. I don't see anyone contorting their jaw. You can't do it. Human molars meet up. They do not slice. So we're just looking, okay? Carnivores have teeth like this. Omnivores have teeth like this. Humans have teeth like this. It's a clue. What about bite size? This young lady is singing her heart out, but her mouth doesn't really open big enough to bite the side of a cow or a pig or a deer or whatever. But the wolf and the mountain lion, oh, they can do a very good job opening their mouth and biting something. And the, the little, what is this little critter? Maybe a donkey? He can't open his mouth very wide either, but then he doesn't need to. He's chewing grasses and grains, and that's as big as he needs to open it. So my thesis here is that each animal is designed for a certain type of food. And if you eat the type of food you design for, well, you're going to be a lot healthier. You have gasoline cars and diesel trucks. If you put diesel in a gasoline car, what happens? Mm -mm, it doesn't run anymore. What if you put gasoline in a diesel truck? Oh boy, it'd be a big mess. Uh, so you really need to feed yourself what you're designed for. The dog here, eating the whole slice of pizza. Have you ever watched a dog eat? No, raise your hand if you've seen a dog eat. Yeah, everybody's seen a dog eat. What do you think that dog's going to do after he bites that pizza? What's his next step? He's going to flip his head back, and he's going to swallow it down. Is he going to chew it for a while? No, not at all. And then he's going to go for the next piece. <laughs> because dogs don't chew their food. Neither do tigers. They just chomp it a little bit and swallow it. I'll tell you about their stomach acid in a few minutes, but they are capable of doing this, and, and we really aren't. Uh, the other thing is that because of the nature of their jaws and the muscles, they're very powerful, but they can't chew side to side. We can't, okay? Side to side. They can't do that. They have hinged jaws. So they really can't eat vegetables. They don't do well. I know some people who try and get their cats to eat vegan, and it doesn't work well at all. They need certain things. They're designed for certain things. Sometimes when you've got a cell phone out and there's an opportunity to either take a picture or save someone, you have to make a choice. In this case, they made the choice to take the picture. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> have you ever looked at a dog's or a cat's lips? They're very thin. They don't need thick, mobile lips. But what are our lips good for? What if you bit into the side of a piece of fruit? 
you can maneuver. You can spit out the seeds, you can maneuver the food, get the good parts in, not eat the core. Our lips are very useful, but they're not very useful for meat. Meat eaters, carnivores, and omnivores, they have very thin lips, and their tongue is you know, also very uh, flat and not, not thick and mobile like ours, not at all. Also, not only can their jaws not move side to side, but they can't move forward and back. These animals cannot stick their jaws out or in. They have very powerful muscles that just close the jaw. And if you've ever been bitten by a dog, you know that the muscles are extremely powerful, worse than being bitten by a human, because we have these little muscles that are very mobile for our lower jaw, whereas they have this tremendously powerful temporalis muscle that just chomps right into things. What about speed? This cheetah is really fast. They clocked it at 62 miles per hour. Isn't that a beaut? The bear, 30 miles an hour. And yet, the best human athletes seem to top out about 24 miles an hour. It's hard to catch an animal. I think when we were kids, didn't we all try and catch birds and rabbits and cats and dogs and everything else? And I do have people object and say, wait a minute, we can catch animal food. Snails. Yes, humans are capable of catching snails, but the yuck factor kind of keeps us away from them, unless you're French. They do eat snails. <laughs> Have you ever heard about the tribes where people are able to run down a deer and catch it? Has anyone ever heard that story? I keep hearing that story from people. What do you think? Can you do it? Anyone here want to try? There are some real problems. Okay, first of all, the deer is faster than we are. Okay, that makes it hard to catch them. Second of all, they have hooves. So if there's a slope, they can run up it, but we can't get up it at all. Or if we can, we'll be climbing and falling down and finally get up there. But then where did the deer go? If we can't see it, then we need to track it, like this beast here. This hound dog has a smelling 100,000 times as strong as a human. But more than that, he can run with his nose to the ground. Would anyone here like to demonstrate running with your nose an inch off the ground? I, so far, I've never seen anyone try that, but come on. This is Texas. <laughs> no, nobody's going to try it. Okay. Um, hound dogs are perfectly designed for that. What about the other, the cats? Can they run with their nose to the ground and find that deer or other animal? You betcha. What about bears and dogs? Sure. Matter of fact, they're all four-legged, aren't they? And we only have two. Hmm. They might have something to do with it. Sense of smell is really important. We tend to look more with our eyes, and uh, carnivorous animals and omnivores tend to do more with their nose. And we all know that. Camouflage is important, too. Anyone see a critter in this picture? Very well camouflaged. The leopard is extremely relaxed, laying on his branch, almost invisible, just waiting for prey to walk underneath and then all over for whatever walked underneath, whether it be a human or an animal. Uh, he looks very, very capable. But humans don't have camouflage because fruits and vegetables don't have eyes. We can walk right up to an apple tree and pick it and the apple tree doesn't run. This cute little kitty, isn't that a cute little kitty? His ears have 20 muscles, allowing to track like radar, sonar more accurately, where a critter might be inside a bush. Even if a little kitty can't see the rat in the bush, he can hear exactly where that is and strike out and grab it. And of course, he has little different paws than we do too. Human ears can't swivel and they can't move independently. You want to try? Can you move your ears independently? I, uh, <laughs> I've tried this. I, I really, not too much, a little bit. And certainly not to keep up with this cute little kitty. Now we have a Hawaiian surfer here and we also have a tiger. One of the differences is that if the Hawaiian surfer were to grab a rooster, anyone here familiar with roosters? You know, they have a spur that's very sharp and about this long, like a thumb. 
on their legs. And that spur is pretty deadly. So if that surfer were to grab a rooster, what would happen? Ouch, ouch, and the rooster be gone. That's if he could catch him. Not likely. What happens if this tiger caught a rooster? Crunch. <laughs> All over. <laughs> End of story. This frontal armoring is common among predators, whether they be carnivores or omnivores. But the vegetarian animals, the vegan animals, do not have frontal armoring. So they really can't, they can't do it. They can't catch them. Okay, now let's look a little bit inside the food. I use a dietary analysis software called the Diet Doctor that I designed and wrote. And uh, so a SAD stands for Standard American Diet. Uh, it's an easy acronym. So what I'm looking at here is protein. On the right column is protein. So the amount of protein that adults need is either 46 or 56 grams per day. That's the recommended daily allowance. That's plenty. Okay. Now, which of these diets are too low in protein? Well, none of them, right? But haven't you heard all your life that you need protein? I've certainly heard it a lot. But when I analyze diets, and I've analyzed diets for decades and decades, I've only found three women who had low protein. And all of these three women were eating half the calories they needed to stay alive. The rule is, if you're eating enough calories to maintain your weight, you're not going to be low in protein. I mean, the, the bottom one, raw vegan diet, 81, and you need 56. Actually, all adults over 50, the RDA is 46. And women, adults is 46. And only men up to 50 is 56. So we're I'm still way too much. The standard American diet is almost three times the protein you need. Now, when we look at Parkinson's disease, we see that this excess protein interferes with the distribution of tyrosine, which is the raw material for making levodopa, which makes dopamine, which is the limiting factor in Parkinson's disease. So this high protein is much more likely to make your dopamine levels lower. Now, dopamine does a lot more than movement. It has to do with mood as well. It's a very important brain neurotransmitter. You can't make as much if you're eating too much protein. The Atkins diet, almost three times as much as you need. The paleo diet, what, 141 grams, and you need more like 40 or 50? Yikes. And then there's the keto diet. Who's heard of the keto diet? Come on, this is very, very popular right now. They have keto cereal, keto cookies, they have keto everything. The keto diet is pretty impressive for the amount of protein in one, the worst place, 235. It's almost enough protein for a whole week. It's amazing, isn't it? Where is the low protein diet? The thing is, everyone gets too much protein. The South Beach diet, now the transition vegetarian diet it still gets 109 grams of protein, double what they need. It's not a particularly good diet. It's a lot of eggs and cheese and white flour, but they're still getting plenty of protein. The super low fat diets, the vegan whole food diets, they all get about that. I, as a vegan, I average around 83 grams a day. And uh, you know, 46 is what I really need. <laughs> It's just hard to get any lower. That's, that's what it is. It's, it's in everything. What about calcium? Now, if you're a young student, you're not worried about your bones getting hollowed out and breaking. So good idea not to go on the keto diet, though, because they have found bone breakage higher for people who stay on the keto diet for a while, or the paleo diet, too, because of the very low amount of calcium. These diets exclude grains and beans, and by doing so, they exclude a lot of the calcium that humans would normally eat. And the, the number, let's uh, look at the keto diet. 284 is the raw amount of calcium in their diet, milligrams. And they need 1,200. Wait a minute. That's alarmingly low to begin with. But when you adjust this for excess protein and sodium, it comes out to a negative 796 milligrams a day. Every day, bone mass is lost on this diet. It is important. Calcium is very important. Now, we'll know 
that on the vegan diet, it's, you're only starting out at the vegan whole food at 727 and you still need 1,200. However, the World Health Organization has determined that on lower protein diets, under 100 grams a day, that you can get by with 800. So it's pretty close. Still, on vegan diets, one of the things you might want to supplement is calcium. But wait a minute, on almost any diet, you might want to <laughs> supplement calcium. But calcium carbonate is the worst form to supplement with. So look for calcium malate. Or there's many, many forms of calcium for supplements. And uh, my book, Vitamins and Minerals Demystified, discusses those. And you can look at which forms are best. If you are supplementing with anything, get the right form and the right amount, both. Isn't it fun looking inside the food? See what's going on in there. Now, people talk about eggs having complete protein, and other things somehow are incomplete in their protein. And so I looked at diets. I made these graphs for my diet doctor dietary analysis software. The top one shows the World Health Organization's ideal spectrum of amino acids. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Adults have eight essential amino acids, kids have nine. So there they are. And below them are the spectrum on one side with tuna and beef and the other side with potatoes and nuts. And guess what? They're both perfect. The amino acid spectrum is fine. The protein quality is fine. No diet that I've ever analyzed has a bad amino acid mix. There are no low quality protein diets. It's a myth. I know the, the egg advertisers were promoting that for a while and saying, but eggs have complete protein. But again, just like low protein, complete protein, I can't find a real diet. I could design a diet that would be deficient, but I can't get anyone to eat it. <laughs> digestion is different too. When you look at animals and you want to say, what kind of digestions do humans have compared with animals that eat meat? If you look at a cat our size, he'd have a digestive length of 12 feet. Well, we have 30 feet of digestive length. And it's a very different type of digestive tract because we have, well, there's so many differences, but we have the ability to squeeze every carbohydrate out of our food during this long travel through the intestine. But they obviously tigers don't have that. And even dogs can't get that out. They, they can't break down the complex carbohydrates like we can. Did you know that 90% of people who choke to death choke on meat? The reason is that carnivores and omnivores have stretchy esophaguses. They can eat huge chunks of food and they don't choke. But humans have cartilage ridges in their esophagus so that when you try and swallow something that's too big, it gets stuck. And you know, the Heimlich maneuver is famous for that, trying to get that chunk of meat out of the airway so that you can save someone's life. So ours are not stretchy and not wide. If they were, then we'd be meat eaters. But they aren't, and we're not meat eaters. Now, the stomach makes up 65% of the capacity of the digestive system in carnivores and omnivores, cats and dogs, but in humans, only 25%. The digestion is very different. Carnivores can eat 30 to 40% of their body weight at one meal. Who here wants to try an 80 pound meal? I don't think even the hot dog competitions, anybody can choke down 80 pounds of hot dogs. It's just simply not possible. Our stomachs aren't big enough. So carnivores and omnivores can eat one time and then wait days before the next or at least overnight. When you feed a dog, how many times a day do you feed it? You say just once. When you feed a cat, maybe one time a day unless you're babying a cat. But when you feed a kid, how often do you feed it? Every hour or two? <laughs> That's what the kids would like. <laughs> or for more adult people, then it would be every three or four hours people like to eat. We're very, very different. Stomach acidity is different too, and this is crucial. Because I know that uh, in some places people eat roadkill. Okay, you're driving down the road and a squirrel got hit by a truck and there he is laying on the side of the road and does anybody just go over there and pick that squirrel up and start chewing on it? 
Not if they want to live, right? Because human stomach acid is about as acidic as a tomato. However, when you look at carnivores and omnivores, you're looking at something more like battery acid. The pH is very different. The pH is so strong that it can kill bacteria. In a, in a dog or a cat, they kill the bacteria. Dogs can eat animals that have been dead for a while. They're related to hyenas that can scavenge dead animals. And it doesn't bother them. But for humans, it would be deadly to do so. And even fresh meat, it's deadly for humans to eat it. Partially because of the stomach acid difference. Now we have alpha amylase petalin, otherwise known as spit or saliva. And this is made by the salivary glands in our mouth. And this predigests starches before we swallow them. Guess what? Carnivores don't have it. Omnivores don't have it. Now the problem here is that I'm throwing out all this science, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, meat tastes good. I know you're thinking that somewhere out there. <laughs> the structure of the intestine is different too. Our large intestine is saculated, it goes in and out. And our large intestine hosts millions of bacteria. They're very important for us. We've, we've all heard about the gut-brain axis and the microbiome that lives in there. There are more bacteria cells in your gut than there are in your whole body. And they're very important for inflammation. Now these differences in carnivores and in omnivores, they don't have bacteria in their gut. It's the same, their, their lower intestine is the same size as the rest of the intestine, and it's not saculated, and they can get rid of fiberless food, but we can't. We really do need fiber, and that's a big difference between us. Without fiber, we can't feed our bacteria, and if our bacteria, when they get the fiber, they create short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid. The butyric acid is the main source of energy for the enterocytes, the cells that line the inside of the large intestine. This is where they get their energy. What happens if you take away their energy because you're not eating fiber, because you're eating meat or dairy products? They get mad. They get inflamed. And you get terrible pain and problems. Colitis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, all of these things very easily related to a lack of fiber in the diet. Can you make a large intestine happy? Sure. Just feed it lots of fiber and indigestible starches. They both can feed that bacteria in there. There's a beautiful Siamese kitty here. This Siamese has absolutely no doubt that she can butcher prey. She can tear apart that rat without any trouble. So can the kitty below. However, I think the guy with the fake nails is kidding himself. <laughs> he does have nails, but they're not conical and they're not retractable. With a true carnivore, they're conical and fully retractable. With an omnivore like a dog, you've seen their nails, they're not quite conical, they're a little flattened, and they don't retract completely or come out completely. There's a big difference in sharpness, too. Dog's nails can be quite annoying, but cat's nails puncture the skin right away. So a big difference in our claws. Well, what happens when you eat the animal? It changes things in your body. We've all heard of blood cholesterol testing. And on the one side I have the blood cholesterol, like 220. 220 milligrams per deciliter is the total cholesterol reading for the average American. What else I can tell you about the average American? Every 32 seconds, there's a heart attack. And about every 50 seconds, a stroke. The reason? Well, it's those pictures. You see how that artery is occluded, clogged? Hardly any room for passage. Any moment, a flap of that plaque can break off and either plug heart artery and cause a heart attack, break off and float to the brain and cause a stroke, or break off little by little, causing vascular dementia, eating up parts of your memory and your ability to think and navigate. And this can happen even at age 20. You have to wait. Now, I mean, how young can you be and still have that? A lot of studies are done on soldiers that died, post-mortem studies. And they looked in their arteries, and they saw full-blown atherosclerosis in these 20-year-olds. You think that's bad. 
They also looked at children's arteries who eat the standard American diet and they're clogged, damaged, inflamed. You think that's bad? They look in premature babies who die in utero. And they looked at their arteries, and their arteries from the diet of the mother are scarred with fatty streaks, which are the precursor to this atherosclerotic plaque. If you do eat meat, you're getting too much saturated fat. And if you're getting too much saturated fat, you're clogging your arteries. Now, how much is too much? Well, the standard American diet about um, is the top one, the red one, 220 for total cholesterol, LDL of 160 or more, and the percent of calories in saturated fat, 15% or more. And believe me, I have analyzed diets with a lot more than that. This is the average American, not a poor American who's, who's eating poorly. So, and the arteries look like that. I just talked to a woman today who said that her arteries were, what, 40% occluded. That's low. I've heard 80 and 90% occluded too, especially the carotid arteries, which supply the brain with its blood. This is a continuous progression throughout your life. Never too young to get started on cleaning up your arteries and keeping them clean. What about sports? You want to play sports with a top artery? It's not going to supply the blood fast enough to your muscles. It's not going to supply the oxygenation and the glucose to your muscles. It's really dangerous. Catherine? You can't tell by looking at somebody. That's a real good point. Uh, we have a relative who is uh, a medical doctor, very prestigious plastic surgeon, and throughout his adult life, he has swam and run and kept up the most vigorous athletic program. He eats a wide variety of foods, and when he got into his 60s, he got a really bad heart attack. He almost died. To look at him, he looked as healthy as could be. Thin, muscular, you can't see the arteries like you're seeing them here. But if you looked at his arteries, it would look worse than the top picture here. He had a quadruple bypass. His life was saved. He became vegan. But only, almost too late, almost too late, within minutes of death, he was. And the damage, of course, to the rest of his body is, is, is already done. So you could get down to maybe 10% of your calories as saturated fat. See, when you eat the saturated fat, that determines your blood cholesterol. So the more saturated fat you eat, the higher your blood cholesterol goes. Where do you find saturated fat? Animal fat, also coconut oil. But animal fat's a common way for people to get it. What kind of animal fat? Well, beef, pork, cheese, these are the main ones, main sources of saturated fat. So on the Mediterranean diet, they only get 10% of their calories as saturated fat. So what happens is they are not building more plaque. And that's a good thing. They're also not getting rid of plaque. They're staying the same. OK, that's better. And a lot of doctors say, go on the Mediterranean diet. And they're right. It's better than an American diet. It's not the perfect diet. What if you lowered it some more to 7% of calories or less? Well, all of a sudden, you're down to 180 for total cholesterol. You're getting to the safe zone. Your chances of a heart attack are drop, drop, dropping. And there are actual medical images of these clogged arteries unclogging over a year or two with a diet that is low in saturated fat. So you might want to just read those labels and check out how much saturated fat there are in the different foods. If you got down to 5% of your calories in saturated fat, your total cholesterol might drop down to 150. Now 150, in the Framingham study, they followed people for decades and decades. They're still doing it. And they found that nobody got a heart attack under 150. Nobody. Ever. In all those decades and all those thousands of people, nobody gets heart attacks under 150. So they thought, oh, well, we'll make a drug to get your cholesterol down to 150. But it doesn't seem to work as well. People do get heart attacks on cholesterol, uh, on statin medication. You can do this if you try. If you want to not have a heart attack or a stroke, a clogged artery, you can just lower your saturated fat in your diet. But I'll tell you, there's a little saturated fat in lots of healthy foods like avocados and nuts and seeds. 
And when I eat my diet with avocados and a few nuts and seeds, maybe an olive here and there, I find my saturated fat, percent of calories is usually four or five percent. Six is the maximum. There's no room for me to have a hamburger. Including, unfortunately, a fake hamburger that they're now selling in a lot of the food. We passed a McDonald's and it said McPlant. So I think this is the first time they're offering a McPlant burger. And I'll be fascinated to know what the saturated fat level is on that McPlant burger. Um, I have not yet seen it, but I'm going to check that out real soon. But anyway, I wanted to let you know that uh, what is the number one cause of death in the U.S. and the world? Number one? Heart disease. Heart attack. Yeah. What's this number two cause of death in the world? Strokes. Same cause, right here. Pretty much the same idea as the last slide, but not as colorful. 15% of calories as saturated fat is just too, mo too much. It promotes high cholesterol and blood disease. If you get it low, your chances of high cholesterol and blood disease, blood di heart disease go down. Now I check different diets. And as far as sat fats go, well, the Atkins diet won the prize for the worst diet and the most saturated fat, 23 grams a day, or 23% of calories. We've seen worse. Not surprisingly, the people we see in the Maui Memory Clinic with memory problems and Alzheimer's disease often have very high saturated fat intake and plugged arteries because the plugged arteries lead to vascular dementia and this destroys the brain. However, when they start eating lower saturated fat diets, those who do choose to do so, they come back. The lights come back on and it's wonderful to see their diagnosis change from Alzheimer's disease to mild cognitive impairment, and sometimes even in full recovery, which we also saw in the clinical trial, the randomized clinical trial, the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, that I designed and ran and wrote the paper and the book on. The book is Nutrients for Memory. The keto diet was the worst as far as fat grams, and the worst as percent of fat, and extremely high, 19%. 6% is the highest you can stay healthy at. And they're feeding people 19% and saying carbs are bad. I haven't seen anybody die of carbs. I've seen a lot of people die of saturated fat. So if you look at all the different diets, only that the Mediterranean diet on this score was 8% of calories. Okay, just a little bit higher than it should be, and it managed to stabilize people who were really sick. If that's as far as you can go, it's a huge step better. But maybe after a while on the Mediterranean diet, you want to just want to step down on the cheese and poultry and go a little bit healthier. Now, for the health effects of meat. Not surprisingly, when humans eat red meat, it raises the risk of heart attack two and a half times. Heart attack's pretty nasty. Deadly a lot of the time. When they're not deadly, they can degrade your life tremendously. Now, a lot of you here are too young to get a heart attack, but you may already have the clogged arteries to get ready for it. And heart attacks can happen in your 30s and 40s, and they do commonly, although they're more common when you get a little bit older. Okay, who wants to get colorectal cancer? Just eat red meat. 300% higher risk from eating red meat. One of the factors is nitrosamines because they add nitrate. The meat, when it's dead, is gray. It's a dead animal. It's a corpse. corpse. So they add nitrate to it. Nitrate is salt. It preserves it and makes it bright red. Unfortunately, the nitrite is converted to nit the nitrate is converted to nitrite and then into nitrosamines in the digestive tract where it causes cancer, especially colorectal cancer. There are many other factors in meat that promote cancer. Also, meat doesn't have the antioxidants that we need to stop that. So each bite of food should be made of whole plant so that we get polyphenols like quercetin that protect us. They're anti-inflammatory. They're antioxidant. They protect our brain, our hearts, our arteries, our joints, everything. But you're wasting your time if you're eating food that don't have these. And that would be any kind of meat or pork or chicken. Fish doesn't have them either. 
Eggs don't have them, cheese doesn't have them, or any dairy products. They don't have antioxidants or polyphenols or anti-inflammatories. In fact, they're the opposite. They're inflammatory. Increase cancer death. Now, not just cancer cases, but cancer death from one ounce per day of red meat, 29%. Now, I'm going to test your math skills. Serving red meat, three ounces. Okay? What's your increased risk of death or cancer? Anyone want to figure that out without their cell phone calculator here? <laughs> and a lot of people don't just eat three ounces of meat. This is really a modest amount. A lot of people, you know, get that quarter pounder, and that's a lot more. That's eight ounces. You can calculate that one up if you want. As far as processed meat, though, it's 50% increased risk of cancer death for each ounce per day. How's that bologna sandwich sounding now, or bacon, or sausage, or hot dogs? Uh, I read a study, I was astounded. In children, they looked at children who ate a lot of hot dogs versus those who didn't eat hot dogs at all. Their risk of cancer was nine times, 900% from eating hot dogs and other processed meat. Now we all know that's kind of the scrapings off the slaughterhouse floor that go in there. They're very deadly scrapings. One of my recent books is Diabetes Breakthrough, The Key to Insulin Resistance. And I wasn't surprised to see this study that showed that meat eating more than doubled the risk of diabetes. If you keep your saturated fat low, well, it's a long story and probably not appropriate for this lecture, but if you're curious, you can read either this book or if you're scientifically oriented, I published a paper in a Biological and Pharmaceutical Science Journal late last year on diabetes too. You can look under Google Scholar and probably find that one. Now, I mentioned ulcerative colitis, a very painful and unpleasant disease. Five times more likely with red meat. And kidney failure. Who needs that? Meat directly damages the kidney. There's no doubt about it. So these health effects of meat are going along with the fact that humans are not designed to eat meat in the first place. I think I made that point in the first half. We're just not designed to catch meat, to grab it, to butcher it, to chew it, to swallow it. We can't really digest it. We're going to die. <laughs>